if you have a good year as a football team in Saskatchewan, it affects the whole province. It makes the winners more bearable. The people are much more friendly. There's something about football in Saskatchewan that goes border to border, north, south, east, and west. They take a very active interest. It doesn't matter whether you want to sit at Coffee Row in January or June. You're going to discuss football in the CFL, and you're going to discuss the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. They knew all the names of the players. They, they knew where all of us lived. If you walked down the street, they were ready to talk to you, bump into them in the store. Uh, they knew which car was yours. If it was parked where it shouldn't be parked, you were in big trouble. The coaches and the players often say it's living in the fishbowl here, which is a good thing if they're winning, a bad thing if they're losing, because Don Matthews, who coached this football team, once said, I hate standing over looking at the cantaloupes in the store and having some lady ask me, why didn't you gamble on that third down play? And that's the way it is in Saskatchewan. I had never been anywhere where the topic of conversation 24 hours a day is football. It didn't matter where I went, whether it was to a restaurant, to a movie, just to the neighbors. They talk Saskatchewan Rough Rider football, and it does take a while to get used to. And the other thing is when you leave it, you miss it because, uh, you, you know, you, you sometimes wonder, if it, could you talk about something else, please? But when you, when you leave that situation, you really miss it because they care about the CFL and especially the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders training facilities, I, I thought were pretty good because anybody who grows up where I did, they look pretty good. But, but they were a bit of a joke because uh, we, we dressed above the old exhibition grounds. It was a little funny place with uh, not very good facilities. But then we had to run across the track to get to our playing field because we practiced inside the racetrack. And, and the big concern was that, that players were going get, to get killed by horses. And there almost were some players killed by horses running across the field. But we practiced out there, and it was a terrible practice field, just hard as a rock. It was really not a good place. But it was just kind of one of those fun things. And when you're 25, trying to race a horse across the track is, 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 good, is, is good fun. The danger was that you would uh, get hit by a horse when you were going to practice because they were always running around there, and, and the trotters were quite quiet. And a matter of fact, that's how my good friend Jack Goda met his wife, was she was riding a horse around the track and ran him over. Eagle Keys uh, was probably, in my view, the greatest coach that ever coached here. And it wasn't necessarily uh, because of what he did on the field and so on. Uh, if you remember when Eagle became a head coach here, it was 1965. In 1963, uh, the Rough Riders had got Ron Lancaster out of Ottawa. Um, Ken Preston had made a trade for, I think, a bottle of scotch, he said. Lancaster and Russ Jackson were the two quarterbacks in Ottawa. They had to decide which one was going to go, and, and Ronnie was the one. He came here to Saskatchewan. Bob Shaw was the head coach at the time, and Lancaster and Shaw just did not get along. Eagle Keys came as a head coach in 1965. And he was such a down-to-earth guy that he and Ronnie hit it off right away. And uh, he let Ronnie run the offense pretty well. Uh, he was such a part of this community. Eagle was just such a wonderfully kind guy, and his wife, Joyce, um, was just a tremendous woman. And it would not be uncommon for Eagle Keys um, to go out to a sports dinner. He wasn't a great speaker behind the microphone, but, but you sit him down in the corner after, and he'd start telling stories. Uh, he'd start playing the spoons. He, he could play the spoons, which nobody I know can master it the way he did. And the next thing you know, it would be 3, 4, 5, or 6 o'clock in the morning, and Eagle would say, well, we're going for breakfast. And so we'd all pile in his car, and we would head over to his house. And he'd walk through the front door, and he'd just announce, Joyce, we got company. And nobody was misbehaving. It was, it was just a fun night. Joyce would come down, and there'd be bacon and eggs all over the place and everybody would go home and sleep all day. Eagle would head into the office and uh, go through another day of work there. He was just able to make that sort of connection with people, uh, and not just his players, like the players loved him, they knew he was tough, but he was able to sit down with the fans and, and, and give them his time. And when a head coach in this city does that, uh, he, he's, he is a god here. Growing up, I, I was George Reed a lot. I was—I uh, thought I was going to be a running back 
fullback, you know, type thing. And I also enjoyed being a Ron Lancaster as well, because I thought I could throw the football. But uh, my first introduction to high school at fo football was in Gull Lake under the great Jerry Elmsley, who uh, ran our football program there. And his first day at training camp uh, for high school football, first practice ever, basically, for myself. And we're sitting there at our first practice, and us farm boys are standing there wondering what position we're going to play. And uh, Coach Elms, he throws me the football, and I said, oh, good, I'm going to be a quarterback. He said, no, bend over. You're the center. Snap the ball to the quarterback. So <laughs> that's how my offensive line day started. I saw a statistic someplace that it was 15,000 people a year or something that leave Saskatchewan to live somewhere else. But once you're a Saskatchewan fan, football fan that never changes and you might you know cheer for Calgary or Edmonton or wherever you move to but uh, when it comes down to it and the green and white are in there your heart says Saskatchewan that never changes so they're all across the country if you go right across Canada uh, no matter where you go uh, there's a large following of Rough Rider fans although the guys have probably moved 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 years they're still Rough Rider fans, and when the Rough Rider comes to town, they all show up. Uh, I know here in Calgary, uh, you know, on any given day, it could be 95 to 100 out, uh, degrees out, and you'll see people with star, uh, with toques and scar, green scarves and everything else when the riders come to town. It just shows you how many, how many fans there, there were, although a lot of them moved away. In the 1950s, 1960s, um, the Rough Riders used to have a program where they would pick a player of the game, a uh, player of the year, and the fans would vote on this. Well, during the 1960s, the, whoever was chosen the player of the year would be awarded a steer, a live steer. And this was because one of the rider executives or presidents uh, was in the cattle business, so he had these steers laying around. Anyway, one year, Huey Campbell was chosen the player of the year, and he won the steer. Well, over the course of that night's celebration, the steer was always awarded at a game at halftime. They'd trot the steer out, present it to the player, then he'd give it back to them, and they'd take it back to the barn, where presumably they'd chop it up and give them some supper or something. But nevertheless, Huey got the steer, gave it back to them. Well, during the course of the night's celebrations, somebody decided to go get the steer. And they took this steer, and it ended up in somebody's backyard. And the people who had it decided they were going to hold it for ransom. And there was actually a pretty extensive search going on in Regina, because it was getting to be a rather serious situation for some people, to find this steer. And apparently, eventually, they found the steer in somebody's backyard, tied up. And of course, to this day, everybody denies uh, who took the steer. But I'm pretty sure it was Gordon Barber, who was a legendary old rough rider who played with him in the 30s and 40s, uh, who grabbed that steer and stuck it in somebody's backyard. Like everything in Saskatchewan, it's close. Taylor Field, uh, the fans are right on top of you. They're avid, they're loud, they're, uh, they're behind our Saskatchewan Rough Riders. It, it was a pleasure to play there. Now, I know visiting teams didn't like coming in there. I can remember Joe Cap and the BC Lions coming in there uh, when they were the, the power in the West, and it was always sold out. So they put people on the sidelines. And if a uh, Saskatchewan Rough Riders say George Reed got pushed out of bounds, the fans would hold him up. If Joe Cap ran out of bounds, they'd put him on the ground, pound him a couple of times, and then shove him back on the field. And they, they took it very serious when teams come into Taylor Field. That is their backyard. And when you come into their backyard, they didn't want you there. Taylor Field was a nightmare. I mean, you had fans that, that were rabid, and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders were the team at that time. They were one of the teams in the Eastern Conference also with Ottawa and Montreal. But in Saskatchewan, you faced the mystique of Taylor Field. They beat the BC Lions at that time anyways on so many fourth quarter drives that used to drive us crazy. We'd beat them all day long. In the fourth quarter, they'd find a way to win. We'd fumble the ball, they'd drive 70 yards, or they'd kick that field goal or something. Something would happen at Taylor Field that they would win the game. Why and how, I don't know. And if I ever find out, I'll get the guy responsible.
I can remember a story where one time in, in Taylor Field, they run a handoff. Ronnie runs a hands a handoff here. Then it's going to then it's a reverse coming around. And after Ron hands off, he's going to lead the reverse. I read it pretty quickly, so I get out on the edge at, and I'm out. And the first thing I see is Ron Lancaster running at me and being that highly intellectual guy that I am. I have enough time to actually think that if I hit Ron Lancaster and kill him right here in Taylor Field, I will not get out of the stadium alive. So Ronnie comes and he starts to cut me down. He cuts, he grabs my ankles and tackles me down. He actually makes a pretty good block. But I'm actually thinking about, I can't hit Ron Lancaster. I mean, that's just not, doesn't happen. David Ridgway uh, is a very, very good friend and close friend of mine. And, and uh, as his holder, when I was, when I was a, a rookie and, and in my first couple years in Saskatchewan, when they said who wants to or who can hold for field goals, I put my hand up. But then again, I put my hand up if they said who can sweep the locker room. You know, I just wanted a chance to be on the team and be on the roster, and I would have done anything to do it. So I thought holding on field goals would be another way to keep me on the roster and maybe keep my job a couple more years if I had to. I felt of all the kickers that I ever worked with and, and all the kickers I've seen and, and got to know, Dave was as close to the real, a real football player <laughs> as they come. He wasn't exactly the most aggressive player, but he was, he was a tough guy. I mean, at one time on a, fake, on a fake field goal, he said to me, he said, Glenn, you roll out to your right. I got your backside. We were, <laughs> we were in Edmonton, as a matter of fact. He said, I got your backside. No one gets you from behind. Well, I rolled out to my right. I got nailed in the back. I got hit down into the turf. I had grass in my, in my mask and everything else. And I turned to Dave and he said, oh, they made great moves. And I watched the film and Larry Ruck and Willie Pless ran straight. And Dave made himself as skinny as possible as they blew by him on the backside to get me right in the back. So I'm not sure that he was the best, he was, you know, the best blocker as a kicker comes, but, but he, was a, he was a good football player. My first year starting at guard, and we're playing in Calgary, and we're playing against, and I'm playing against John Helton. And John Helton, for some reason, switched over me, and that reason was because I was really bad and he was really good, so he was going to have a big day. And Ron Lancaster was our quarterback, and uh, probably about the second or third play of the game, uh, John Helton, like he beat me clean, I didn't even touch him. And I look back, and he's got a hold of Lancaster by the scruff of the neck and the britches of the pants, and he throws him about 10, 15 yards down the field. And I could see the, the blood come out of Ronnie's arm from the turf burns and all this stuff, and um, I'm in trouble. Like, he hit our man, Ron Lancaster, and he hit him pretty good. And I go back and huddle, and Ronnie looks at me, and i am got, you know, got my eyes down because I'm like a whip pup. And, he called me a lot of names, and none of them were Roger. Yeah, I became the Undertaker. I think about I think it was 1971 in there someplace, and we had played Edmonton, and I'd had a a really physical year. I'd really hurt a lot of people that year. I don't know what it was. I'd hurt several quarterbacks throughout the league. And finally, against the Edmonton Eskimos, I'd hurt one of their quarterbacks the game before, and I'd Liverman, and I'd knocked out Wilkie, and knocked out Syme, and then back and knocked him out again. And and uh, that's and Norm Kimmel tried to get me thrown out of the game, uh, out of the league, and that's when I became the Undertaker. And it was uh, I was fined, I was fined by Commissioner Jake Kadar a hundred dollars for excess excessive roughness throughout the game. I never got a penalty. Uh, but <laughs> now, didn't say I shouldn't have got one. I said I didn't get one because, uh, in hindsight, uh, the uh, there's no question the tactics, the, the close lining and head slapping, and the clipping on the offensive side. The tactics in those days were were pretty brutal. Close lines, hitting quarterbacks high was not illegal. Bill put so many 
quarterbacks out of games that they put in a new rule <laughs> and uh, didn't let it happen. The close lane ended, ended that year. <laughs> I think EO Keys told me they call it the Baker rule. They said we're, we're outlawing the clothesline. line. And uh, so that was the last year. I think that was the last year of the closed line. Also, I think they, uh, they eliminated the head slap because at that time, uh, the head slap was a wonderful technique, which was too bad they got rid of that one because that was really fun. <laughs> One time in 1989, I was in a game that uh, the very last second, we were fighting for a playoff spot with the BC Lions. In the very last play of the game, Matt Dunnigan threw a Hail Mary pass to David Williams, and David Williams and I had been in a pretty much a fist fight for 60 minutes of that game, and I had another golden opportunity to put my helmet in the ear of David Williams as he stood there for this Hail Mary pass, and I got a pass interference call. Kept the drive alive. And Matt Dunnigan ended up moving down on another pass interference call and scoring the winning points on a quarterback sneak that put them ahead of us in the playoff race at that time. And now we were on the brink of losing our playoff position. Had a few games left in the regular season. So needless to say, I was public enemy number one in that province. And I had a listed phone number. Uh, I remember talking to John Gregory, who was our head coach, and saying, you know, I, I might as well face the music. I, I made a crucial mistake. You know, all I had to do was let him catch the ball and tackle him. Made a big mistake, and the fans are going to want to take a piece of me. And I got calls in the middle of the night and, and threats and, and <laughs> went on all the talk shows. And, and then I found out I got a letter from a, a, a mother in, in the game prior to, uh, prior to the game kicking off. I sat in the stands with a kid. He's probably about eight or nine years old. And we sat and talked. Uh, he, he did most of the talking, and, you know, I just sat and listened. And she wrote me this letter. I still have it today. And she said, uh, you know, she said, um, Glenn, you know, cost us the football game. And we all rode that emotion um, with his mistake. But he said, after it's all said and done, there's a kid that, that has a hero. And for me, that was, uh, that was a time when I thought, you know, I thought to myself, that's why I play the game. This is why I wanted to play as a kid. And it sort of refocused me, and, and that year we went on to win the Grey Cup. The very first uh, game that I played in Saskatchewan, um, the, the coach at that time was Bob Shaw, and uh, he had the wisdom to put me at tight end. And I not only didn't have any practices, because I showed up late in the season just to get there and go to a game, uh, I had never played in the in with all the big guys, you know, been close. So I'd, I probably didn't have that good of a game. I remember that uh, during the game, I, nothing happened, I never was, no pass was thrown to me. And uh, I, I, in my memory is that I did something on a punt cover and made a tackle, but uh, that could be, you know, after a lot of years, kind of shining it up a little bit. But I remember that the, the next day at the film session, he asked me to stay after the film session. And the other players all knew that that meant I was getting cut. I didn't know that. And he called me in and said that he was going to release me. And I said, well, I don't know how I had the nerve to say this, but I said to him, Coach, if you release me, without ever throwing me a pass, then you, you would be making a very large mistake because uh, George Reed told me that you guys need somebody that can catch a ball and you won't find anybody that could catch a ball better than I can. And uh, so my suggestion to you is you give me one more game, move me out to wide receiver and cut me after I drop my first pass. And he did that or otherwise I, you wouldn't be talking to me now. <laughs> In Saskatchewan, we were very fortunate. We had the Saskatoon Hilltops, and this is back when junior football was big. Now, you had the Saskatchewan Hilltops, you had the, the Regina Rams, 
Then you had all the other colleges. But a lot of the football talent back in the early 60s came from the junior football teams. I mean, if you just look at our football club in Saskatchewan, Ron Atchison played 18 years or 20 years, whatever it was. He was a s Hilltop. Wayne Shaw played for the Saskatoon Hilltop. Ted Dashinsky, Saskatoon Hilltop. Uh, Wayne's brother, Cliff Shaw, played for the Saskatoon Hilltop. Hank Dorsch, uh, Don Banuke, Bill Baker. I mean, we had a ton of guys. Roger Alday. All played junior football. And you know what? They were all local kids that wanted to play in Saskatchewan from Swift Current, Saskatoon, you name it out there. They were from those small towns. They wanted to be Rough Riders. They wanted to play in Saskatchewan. And when they got the opportunity to play, I think they may have been a little bit low in ability at that time, but as soon as they put that green and white on in the province of Saskatchewan, their ability level, as much as their enthusiasm, it just came forward because that they loved playing in Saskatchewan because it was it's all they'd ever heard and they wanted to be part of it. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders have always paid attention to the rural roots and because football is so big here you'll find virtually every small town in this province has some kind of a football program whether it's three-man football, six-man, nine-man, it doesn't matter they all play it. Well back in the 1970s um, the Regina Rams which were an outstanding junior football team used to attract a fair amount of football players from small centers and the, the two that I remember the most are Bob Poley who came in here from Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, which is north of Regina. It's a small little uh, community up there with not a big football program, but it, they have a football program. The other one was Barry Aldag, who came in from Gull Lake, and then his brother Roger, who followed him. There's a tremendous high school football program in Regina and in Saskatoon. Basically, every high school in those two cities and the smaller cities in Moose Jaw, Prince Albert, Yorkton, they play football. They play 12-man football, three-down football. Unlike some of the places in Vancouver and in, in Ontario, they play Canadian rules football. So it's part of it. You had kids coming in here from all over the province trying to make the Rams uh, or the Junior Hilltops up in Saskatoon because they knew that if they showed anything, it would be a ticket to the CFL. And there's nothing that the Saskatchewan Rough Riders wanted more or should want more is to have players from these small towns uh, get on their roster. And, and uh, the ones who have made it, it's done tremendous things for the riders out in rural Saskatchewan. Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. Live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere.